Good evening, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. I'm Alta Lynn Price, a translator from Italian and German, and a member of the Translators Collective Sedilla and Company. We're delighted to be collaborating with the Center for Fiction to bring you this monthly series and are grateful for the Center's support. These translation clinics are intended as a knowledge sharing open session for translators and lovers of translation from all backgrounds and experience levels. Each month we invite a different literary translator to present on or discuss a subject of their choice, usually with a Cedilla member, though this month we'll be shaking things up a bit, followed by a Q&A with attendees. Topics may range from questions and theories of craft to submissions, contracts, and other practical concerns, always with an eye to literary translation as a profession. Attendees are encouraged to bring questions from their own practice. These sessions will be recorded and available for later viewing. Live captioning is also available. You can click on the CC button on the bottom menu for various options. We invite you to turn your camera on if you like and settle in for the conversation, during which everyone except Edward and Alex will be muted. Feel free to add comments and questions in the chat, which tonight I will be moderating. For the second half of the session, we'll open up the conversation. If you're comfortable speaking on screen, raise your hand either by clicking at the bottom of the participants list or by using the reactions button, and you'll be invited to unmute your microphone and ask the question yourself. Or if you prefer I read your question, please send it privately to Alta Price Sedilla in the chat. We'll try to get to all of them, but we apologize in advance if we run out of time. For those who are unable to attend our live events, we encourage you to email questions or comments before or after the sessions to translationclinics at centerforfiction.org. We hope to make these conversations ongoing to include viewers in as many time zones as possible. And now let's dive in. Today, we have the good fortune to hear from Edward Gauvin and Alex Zucker. A 2021 Guggenheim Fellow, Edward Gauvin has translated in various fields from film to fiction with a personal focus on contemporary comics, BD, and post-surrealist literatures of the fantastic. His work has been shortlisted for several major prizes and awards. He has received fellowships and residencies from the NEA, PEN America, the Fulbright Program, the Lannan Foundation, and the French and Belgian governments. As a translation advocate, he has written widely, spoken at universities and festivals, and taught at the Breadloaf Translation Conference. The translator of over 400 graphic novels, he is a contributing editor for comics at Words Without Borders. Alex Zucker's most recent translation is the novel The Movement by Petra Hulova, published last month by World Editions. More info at alexjzucker.com. Tonight, Alec, Edward and Alex will talk about translating when visuals are involved, looking at what new constraints or inspirations can crop up. They will also consider some modes of advocacy for translators that have been overlooked up to now. And with that, I pass the mic to Alex and Edward. Hello, thank you. Sorry, I had to jump up. I realized... Um, <laughs> I didn't have a pen in case I wanted to take notes. I already thought of something that is not written in my printout of questions, but which um, Edward and I discussed in preparing for tonight's clinic. Um, so uh, I think with that, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen, correct, Edward? Um, sure, sure. I think that's what we wanna do. Um, let's see. I am, um, <clears throat> there we go. And it says you are now screen sharing so everybody can see that, correct? All right. So we're gonna dive right in and um, uh, Edward and I, you know, I had a, a, quite a few questions for Edward. Um, after inviting him to come and share and, and uh, conduct this clinic. So um, in response to my questions, Edward put together a slideshow. So um, my questions will be sort of jumping off points, but this will be, it's um, well, you'll see how it unfolds. And um, so I'm just gonna dive right in. I'm not gonna explain everything. So the first question though, that we like to ask um, everybody who, who comes onto the clinic is, um, 
how did you get into translating? And in this case, I, I want to point out, of course, Edward does a lot of different types of translation. But tonight, because we hadn't had yet somebody speak about translating uh, comics or graphic novels or mm, text with visuals of any sort, um, we're going to be talking about that. So I want to ask Edward, how did you get into translating comics and graphic novels? Or actually, one of the things we can talk about is whether you can just say comics, because Edward kind of set me straight on that at one point. But Edward, take it away. Well, no, no, thank you, Alex. Thank you. And, and thank you, Alta. And thank you to Sadilla and the, uh, uh, the Center for Fiction. Um, it's, I, I'm, I'm uh, uh, what a crowd. What a crowd. Alex, I tell you, I tell you, I could sure use a good crowd because, uh, you know, in my line of work, I don't get no respect. I, translators get no respect, Alex. So I'm happy to reminisce, but, you know, uh, I'm wary of offering my story as an example of how to break in. It's, it's, uh, I, I don't think it's scientifically replicable, you know, um, but uh, um, I think I just got my, uh, my first couple of gigs from hanging around Comic Cons. You know, it's a, uh, you know, uh, uh, so the first ones were with uh, iBooks, which is now defunct, and Arkea Studios Press, which is also now defunct, and First Second, which is not defunct and happily has Macmillan Pockets. Um, so it, it might give you some sense of this sort of volatility of the, the comics market, uh, which, you know, extends to a certain, a certain, to a certain degree to publishing altogether. Um, uh, so if we hit, these are just some of the, uh, you know, uh, covers of things, um, uh, things right. I've done in the past and, uh, it, to give some sort of context to where I kind of slid into this, um, the, the evolution of, of French comics or French Franco-Belgian comics, uh, BD in the States, let's hit the next slide. All right. So I think of the three ages of Franco-Belgian, uh, comics in America as so you have the Tintin, and the asterisk kind of stage, which means basically the uh, children's stuff, right? Um, or or, or so, uh, and also adventure comics, right? Adventure humor comics, and then you know you get the invasion of heavy metal, right? Um, just headlined by the art of Moebius, but uh, and then uh, you know the the French comic, the French uh, magazine of science, mostly science fiction and fantasy comics, and sort of comics coming of age. Uh, gives way to uh, the American version, which is heavy metal. And then in the mid 2000s, you get uh, the age of Persepolis, right? Which is where I come in. In the mid 2000s, graphic novels were a boom sector in publishing. Major houses were all launching their own comics imprints, you know, and people wanted to bottle, rebottle the Persepolis lightning, right? So, um, uh, and, and it, Persepolis also redefined French comics as, as having a more indie look. So that affected the kinds of publishers that were going to touch them. You, in the mid 2000s, you're obviously getting French comics not from comics publishers, but from mainstream publishers, maybe with comics imprints or comics arms. Uh, and um, I, I've made a career in a fairly small but now growing business of translating French comics without ever working for, for what I think of as the majors of the uh, North American scene. Or these are people, uh, relatively small publishers like John and Quarterly or um, NBM or Fanographics who have been publishing comic, uh, foreign trans comics in translation for several decades. Um, but generally they have, they had longstanding um, est uh, established relationships with translators. So I wasn't going to, um, you know, butt in there. Right. And, and also I think that, you know, um, some of them also could not really uh, let's say keep pace rate wise, you know, um, uh, not mm -hmm. that there's a universal rate or anything, but um, so, uh, and I, I guess uh, if I had to add a column to this, um, uh, I would say that since the two, th there was a dip, you know, around the recession, 2008, everyone, and then uh, out of say, 2000, 2012 onward, there's been a huge, huge, huge boom. Um, I mean, there literally was this just really tight bottleneck around 2010 where 
I'm pretty sure I was doing at least half of the French comics coming into English, if not more. But that's no longer true at all, I think, um, because right now the scene just has just become sort of exploded and become scattered, and it's not really defined by a single aesthetic or 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 uh, or genre or um, or kind of comic anymore. Because the the kinds of publishers that do it um, are vastly diversified, and the uh, digital comics and having French uh, have vastly diverse, diversified. So that's right. that's changed things a lot. Right. Okay. Also, I want to remind us both to. Uh, speak at a measured pace because I know sometimes I get caught up um, just so we can get the good captions if possible, especially if, we, if uh, we're talking about names and stuff. It's a reminder for me and for you. And 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 I want to remind people who are attending to get your questions ready for the second half. Anything you want to ask, fair game. Yeah. No, so I think should we should. I... I should. Yeah, I think we should definitely move on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. So. This... Oh, so my next question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, 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 no. What do you think makes translating text with pictures different from translating text alone? I mean, this is really kind of the meat of this clinic. Yeah, so I'm going to um, tackle the most obvious one that everyone gets hung up on first, which is, I mean, I mean uh, uh, the most obvious constraint and the most often discussed is, is, is space, right? It's a very real concern. And this is why comics translation gets sub compared to subtitling a lot. It, it does sometimes come down to a couple letters but I think that technology is now common in both fields in subtitling with, with time-coded software, with character counts, and in comics, um, you know, uh, uh, with, with a digital uh, publishing, like with a sort of being able to layer uh, different parts of a, of a panel um, ha that's changed. So what you're seeing here is, is, you know, it's labeled up here in case you can't read the, on the, on the left, you have a, a Donald Duck strip from 49, a Karl Barks strip, and um, from then, and then on the right side, you have the first Danish translation. Um, in fact, there are two Danish translations, both by done by, by Sonia Rindem, and, and she, you know, won a major prize, I believe, in Denmark for, for translating Donald Duck um, uh, comics. But here you're seeing something relatively rare, right, where the, the shape of the word of the speech balloon has been completely altered. Um, uh, that's that's uh, it's it's generally okay to expand, but this is a rare case where they shrank it. Um, sometimes the problem, at least back in the day, with shrinking is that there was, sometimes was not art behind the balloon, uh, because the balloons are put in by hand and with you know glue. Uh, so um, uh, right. and 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 then um, but but like in, that's not that's not something we have to worry about anymore. But like so, the two things to to think about with this are are. Uh, you know, balloon shape and also um, font, right? Right, where we, we're going from an artist hand lettered font to a, a uh, um, uh, well, uh, clearly a, a machine font with an even kerning and, and, um, and spacing. Um, so my problem, I guess, is that the focus on fit I've, uh, uh, as the only spatial constraint neglects the way that the text interacts with the image or deploys its own visual aspects for, for added meaning. And this is less of a concern for subtitling. You're, you're, you may complain about the subtitling font or the color, but you're not going to complain about, like generally not gonna complain about, or worry about does it you know, aesthetically interact with um, the, Image because it, it's it's a, uh -huh. it's it's understood as non diegetic, completely non diegetic. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is this is uh, just an example from an American comic. Um, John Workman who was a, a major, uh, a very prominent letterer, and who uh, who's famous for doing extensive runs on Thor, the uh, the Marvel title Thor. But I just wanted to sh see show how you know it's not just about fitting words into it. It's also about you know, right. how you can leave negative space and, and actually enhance emphasis on words as he does with, you know, finally on the, on the bottom left, or right. I, I think it's almost like a little haiku on, on the top right with the, I think mm. I tasted blood. It has, mm. it has a, um, has a certain grace to it. Uh, mm -hmm. And on the next slide, I, another thing to think about then is also, uh, this is something that'll be familiar with uh, to, to theatrical translators is how the, how it plays as dialogue. Right, because um, um, I don't. I, some people will argue that people actually, you know, definitely vocalize, not just subvocalize when they're reading comics. 
I won't go so far, but I will say that like in this book that I did back in 2013, Kedoxe or Weapons of Mass Diplomacy, then on the, on the if, um, you know, here the, the French person is, uh, the French version has the same word repeated over four balloons. And I just didn't think that that was going to play quite as well in terms of his, his frust uh, emphasizing the character's frustration, right? So I have, it's a little inelegant in that I don't have just four words, right? I have five and I snuck one <laughs> right. in there, right? And Al That was something uh, I had asked you about, right? Yeah. Whether as a translator, you ever have the ability to add a balloon and you said no. No, but that actually kind of blew my mind because because <laughs> um, you know it had never come up, but it would be fascinating if translators were um, allowed into that deep into the machinery, right? That like that that was it, it. It was it was it was it was not something that I I had ever asked for or or mm -hmm. um, or or pursued. Um, and and uh, there there are examples where I mean it's it's already a rare enough instance where we get an artist to read hand, to redo by hand. The sound effects, and that's happened like mm, two or three times, and that's mm -hmm. it, you know. And 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 um, and that's already sort of like a, a huge landmark. I wish it would happen all the time, almost. But, you know, um. And this is, and this want to emphasize that this is your translation. The first couple of slides we looked at were from other people, but this is this is Edward's work here. Yeah. So keep going. Yeah, let's let's keep going. So, so then, uh, uh, yeah, let's let's keep going. Uh, the other one is so um. Right, this is a famous modernist poem we have here, uh, you know, um, which I've put into a speech balloon with its 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 um, author, uh, author. But uh, right, and 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 this is a you know standard. It's a canon. It was at least a canonical poem in in intro lit classes, right? To to show how you know sort of uh, uh, how drastically enjambment can change your feeling of mm -hmm. uh, of 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 something. Um, uh, but, um, and obviously, you know, you're not gonna get that in a balloon, right? But you still <laughs> occasionally will um, get it on, let's next, uh, next slide is- This so, is one of my favorites here, yeah. So there are, there are times when you can sort of insist on it or play with it, right? Like clearly we were trying to map with some, you know, we were trying to map the, the approximate profile of the, the English onto the French here um, um, and and this is from like a 2019 book I think with uh, um, with New York Review Comics a, a, a book that took me 10 years to find a publisher for so you know uh, be encouraged uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah and and I think one of the happier things I think here on a on a even smaller level was how um, a, a, uh, the refrain in the sort of I guess second stanza of alone on was able mm. to to mm. uh we're you know we're able to sort of locate it uh more or less in the same places and um you know it's funny because i remember it's one thing one thing i'll never forget is when i was in, in grad school and, and philip levine uh the detroit working class you know uh poet uh, and he was talking about line endings and how you know it was mm. it was good to end a line on um a stronger word like a noun or a verb would be stronger than a, than a than a um than an adverb or you know um so like that just that is something i i think about when i'm trying to you know manipulate this but this is not just my work here is it is also right. the work of the letterer right and 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 then so right uh and i i talked at length with the, the because uh to the letterer for this book um uh his name is uh francois vigneault he's a quebecois comics artist and um he was talking about how you know how he would have things uh, uh, like well, he's talking about his working method, and I found a lot of you know sort of parallels to the the general general ideas about translation in it. So that, that was that mm -hmm. was fascinating. Um, so um, and and it's true that this seems like you know I'm splitting hairs here, right? Like, um, it, but your, your average comic is not going to utilize most of the artistic tools at its disposal. But then again, neither is your average reader going to no notice their effects. So that's that's you know that's not a good argument to neglect these these the, mm -hmm. these kinds of things. Uh, let's hit hit it, um, please. Okay, so this is an example where things get pretty drastic, right? Because on the bottom you have my translation. It's a digital comic, and it looks fine, right? But then you see what the original was, right? And 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 it, it's been speculated. It, it, it's interesting because like in this comic, they do take a lot of care in the English lettering to sort of map it onto the French when the, you know, um, by, you know, by increasing the font size, 
for emphasis or use, just using capital letters, but they, they do everything they can not to, not to have cursive script. And in fact, cursive mm-hmm. script is really oddly rare in American, in English language comics. Hmm. Uh, so, so, so that's the sort of like, you know, you're getting a cultural constraint rubbing up against this form. It's, it's arbitrary because it's cultural, but it's there. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's keep going. I think I'm running late, unfortunately. So um, yeah, okay. Um, so in, in, in this case, what we're looking at is the original excerpt of Letter to Survivors from World Words Out Borders in 2010, right? Uh, um, and they were able to get a font that was based on Jabez, uh, the author, his, his, uh, the cartoonist, his handwriting. And, and then you, if you compare that to the uh, font, the, the hand-lettered um, redone font, you can tell that Francois's work as a letterer is both like and unlike um, Jabez. You know, it, sure, certainly it's more live than a machine font, but it's also it's also kind of a reinvention or a riff, right? Um, and and I do I do feel like that has. I, when, I, when I first saw Francois's uh, uh, um, work, I was I had this uncanny valley experience. I thought, oh no, I mean, like 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 uh, like there people are going to know it's a translation because it looks different. From the original, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and in, oh, and 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 it's um and it, it's it's I find an interesting metaphor for for um for, you know like in, in so much as people are apt to split uh translation into like dealing with form while the author deals with content, and I know that metaphor has a lot of problems with it, um, but um this takes that to another level, right? We're we're actually talking about letter forms, and um, mm-hmm. I think I should keep going, um with the next okay so then the next major thing right is going to be sound effects um sound effects um all right and and i I would divide sound effects into two major categories right the the purely original onomatopoeia and the conventional i'm sorry the uh, conventional or lexical onomatopoeia uh then you know here we see both uh, examples of both blam fully conventional tap conventional right but then uh you know that's that's going to be or slip slip. It's it, so let, let's uh-huh, move on uh-huh. to the next uh, slide. Here we're looking at a whole bunch of conventional ones, and you think so. Okay, all I have to do is look it up in the dictionary, right? These are sound words, right? Uh, toot toot, beep beep, honk honk, toot toot, ploof splash, vlam, slam, wham, bam, take your pick. You know, um, and and the really good thing about these is they allow you to describe off-screen action, right? Mm-hmm. If you go to the next slide. Um, and it's easy to replace, you know, pong becomes, hit it, uh, bang, right? You know, talk, talk, talk becomes knock, knock. And here with the talk, 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 you don't have to see the door, right? Um, and, and so it's right. extra important that you get the, the word carry, the word is doing the duty there, not, not the other, um, right. uh, uh, not, not, not carrying the, uh, doing the work there, not, not the image. And this, this is a sort of fixity of meaning has a certain versatility. Um, you know, uh, if we go to the next slide, right, like here, another example of the same. Um, and I think, you know, in all of, there's a sort of certain bias in American indie comics against sound effects because they feel that they're a little puerile and we want comics to grow up. But, you know, in fun, so if you flip through Fun Home, I think the only sound effects that Bechtel uses is our, our phones ringing. <laughs> <laughs> like right here but then the question here is like you know i generally if i come across this in french comics i'm generally going to cut out the d right uh-huh. you know and there's a lot of problems too um with sound with uh because there's no established ringtone uh established spelling for the cell phone ringtone yet uh-huh. Uh-huh. right so that ushered in a world of problems all right here yeah. let, let's go to the next one um and which brings you to brings us to like you know if i take off it lop the d off of that word to get uh, an, an english ring out of it um how concerned am I with spelling? I, I would say that I'm inordinately concerned with phonemes that do not look anglophone, right? And I know that comics, mm-hmm. you're already talking about more localization than literature. But um, so then if on the, um, this, you know, boom, I'm not gonna have an OU. That's a, that strikes me as a very French phoneme, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. right? Um, and then I also don't wanna spell broom if I can help it, right? Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, um, you know, I might come up with, you know, the, and then here in the bottom right hand corner, you're going to get an example of when the artist contributes by redoing ha- sound effects by hand and the integration is, you know, that, that much superior. 
Next, next. Um, so yeah, so if you're still torn about wondering where their spelling matters, well, all I can say is that's a lot of bunk because <laughs> uh, uh, spelling can land you in deep shit. Uh, you know, um, um, see, because, and the other problem is that, you know, next slide, please. Things that look like words are tricky, right? So you kind of, you're deliberately making it so that it, you're I, I'm almost, altering the spelling so it doesn't sound, doesn't actually look, it isn't, re, re, if I can avoid being reminiscent of a word, of a, of, of a word that might, you know, steer the meaning elsewhere, then I'm going to do so, right? Um, uh, and then the final category, let's see here, uh, next slide is, you know, as we all know, because we're translators, languages don't, oh, okay, so there's also this, this is just for fun, because, um, you know, these days, since people have realized that they're not sound effects for everything, at least not legible ones, then people are deliberately deploying words, right? Um, uh, but like that's kind of, you know, there's a level of over the topness almost whenever that's done. It's, it's, it's sort of a last minute, a la last ditch recourse. Um, yeah, and uh, so the, and the next, the final point I wanna make on onomatopoeia here is that languages don't map, right? Like we know that we don't, we know that languages don't have the same, um, one language have a word for something that the other one doesn't. And so when sound effects come, um, that comes up with sound effects, it's really odd. Because I you know this happens, I believe in manga too, but like you'll have sound effects for very subtle things. Or like in an American comic, if someone is putting a uh, a phone down on a, uh, a table, mm -hmm. I guarantee you there will be no sound effect. Uh -huh. So suddenly you have something there that wasn't there before and you still have to make a legible sound for it, right? You're co mm -hmm. coining, coining a, a um, coining uh, a sound. A, yeah, um, it's great. So then, um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, it should be said of us that we have as many words for you know things blowing up and, and many sound effects for things blowing up as you know the proverbial Eskimos do for snow, but but or Inuit have for snow. But like uh, you know, a, a lot of our sound effects are tied to action scenes, and that I think has to do mm -hmm. with the development of our comics. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and so action scenes can be, you know, I mean, so sound effects can be used for, for directly for clarity or emphasis or abstractly for mood or characterization. And I think they challenge translators to think visually as letterers, but orally as poets also and holistically as designers. I mean, we're, um, I don't, I, I'm not involved in the process of placing, but I do want to design a word that is, you know, visually and orally uh, appropriate. Well, to, you um, have some sense of where the letterer is going to put the word, right? So, you, oh, so even yeah. if you're not controlling that, you can still come up with a translation that takes that into consideration. No, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, um, and then, and then on the next slide is just an example of what. Um, yeah. So then, this is this is a perfect example. I'm, I am sorry. I don't actually. I, I for the life of me, I I, I couldn't find. Who originated this thought experiment? Um, but it, it was it was online at once. It's not online anymore. It doesn't seem to be. But you know, if most people when they see again when they see the left hand panel, it looks fine. You know, I mean, I, I and, and that's maybe what a lot of translated comics are going to look like, especially the more sort of uh, generic uh, mass produced ones. You know, it, it's someone with a with desktop publishing software who is trying to do the best they can with the limited tools they have. And then on the right side, you have the original artist's work, right? Which is not, uh, I mean, even without going, you know, in praise of, of Bill Watterson and his specific virtuosity, it's still something that's gonna be married and entangled with the image in, in, in a way that's it's greater, uh, um, uh, more, more specific. And, and that for me also parallels certain you know, people talk about the translations flattening, you know, here you see some, maybe some literalness, <laughs> literalization yeah. of that idea, of that idea. Absolutely. Um, uh, so yeah, and then in the next slide, it's just, um, you have instances, on, on the next slide, you have instances where it, you're just not going to get a change. I mean, that's, that's so deeply integrated into it that, right. and, and, and so actually deliberately a sort of fourth wall breaking part of this story that right. you're, you're not, there's nothing that's never gonna. So this is um, sort of the equivalent, it just occurs to me now of um, uh, not italicizing so-called foreign words in uh, a typeset book, maybe, mm. right? Which, yeah. which is, is something that has been written about by a few translators 
in the last couple of years in a way that I hadn't really seen it discussed before. And um, I know I've done that, but I've done both ways. And, and I really, um, I appreciate the trends toward leaving words or even deliberately putting in more of them, but it seems like this is, this is somewhat analogous to that. Maybe well, that's not, a really maybe good I'm end. pushing no, it too a, far. It just occurred no, no, no. to me now. It didn't occur to me when we went over it before. I think we should okay. write a, a two-hander essay about that, actually. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah. um, did you uh, want to Well, let's going? see how or... we're doing. I think we're at the halfway point, but I don't, I don't know. I don't remember how many more slides we had to go through. So, I guess it's up to you which ones you really feel like you want to talk about before we go into the Q&A, knowing we want to leave time at the end for your yeah. vision of the future. Okay, well, let's, um, yeah, let's just uh, hit the next, uh, I think we can, I think oh yeah, this is a good yeah. one. All right, well, so in this one, it's Pierre-Henri Gaum Pierre Gaumont's Brain Drain. It's um, about a bunch, it's kind of half, well, it's about a bunch of people running off with Einstein's brain, which if you know the history, it kind of happened. Uh, and in here, the main character is feeling blue, the French slang for which, one of the French languages for which is incarnated in his speech balloon as a cockroach because that's another meaning of the same French word, uh, cafard, right? Um, and so here, uh, so this is about how, how when, pictures, when pictures do the bulk of the work in comics, it's only fitting that you know, we have to take our cues from them. You know, and the artists can set a tone, the colors can set a palette, and these can inform or supplement or refine or inspire our word choices, I think, as much as the text. And in, and in case of this, is, this word play, the images can Prove to be constraints, but also provide solutions, right? So, like here, and you know, I'll, I put my my actually my my, my uh, original was feeling Samsa esque, but the editors thought that that was would not um, might people might not get the reference, so they replaced it with Kafka esque. You know, yeah, which um, I I think you were correct, and and I would have sided with you over the editor on that one because you can't actually feel Kafka esque, but you could feel Samsa esque, but. <laughs> We'll, um, we'll take that up later. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. He's he's lo I mean, he's confused, lonely, alienated, and wandering at loose ends around uh, this giant Kansas asylum. So you know, it's mm. uh, and then yeah, and then for the last point, then uh, is people sent, tend to think uh, translating comics means dealing with uh, wordplay. Next slide, uh, and and humor. You know, when I say I translate comics, people think of this, or they think of the next slide. Well. Uh, uh, but the, you know, the, I think this misconception is rooted in consuming comics as a genre for kids, or uh, instead of a medium in that can express or host any number of genres. And so, sure, I do kids and strips and kids stuff next. Right, I do YA next. I do licensed properties next. Uh, I do science fiction. I do uh, fantasy. Um, I do, but also contemporary fiction. And um, and then one thing that's emerged for me over time, partly because the Francophone comics and translation scene has so greatly diversified, is that working in comics has allowed me to translate across more genres than I would have encountered in prose, simply because the selection of French prose we get to see here lacks that breadth. So I've done, we're going to just race through the, this, this sort of gallery of genres, but with Westerns, um, you get horror, you get uh, chiclet and rom-com, uh, you get... Uh, noir and thrillers, you get true crime, uh, you get uh, contemporary reportage, which is becoming more and more popular, uh, history. Um, in fact, when Alex was talking about, you know, terminology, comics versus graphic novel, I would say nonfiction comics is, long form nonfiction comics is where it's at. Uh, so here we get history, we get uh, period fiction that's historical and a little less historical, you know, uh, um, you get biographies, um, especially of women. Next slide. Um, uh, musicians. Next slide. Um, and the Roman Ramones book never came out because French have much laxer laws concerning uh, quotation of lyrics than the English do, and became too expensive. Uh, I, I, it's, I still sort of begrudge that because it was a it was a really good book to work on. Uh, the you know visual artists. Uh, are the ne next slide, right? Um, Magritte, Dali, Picasso, and, you know, memoir, next uh, slide is memoirs of illnesses, uh, right? Um, next one is uh, other, other topical memoirs. Next slide. Uh, you get essays. Um, 
and you get popular nonfiction, right? Next slide. And, uh, you know, the history of medicine was, uh, was, well, it was a research nightmare, but it was, um, and then uh, reference, you know, reference books and, uh, you know, the ABC of typography book in the center, that was a huge amount of fun, especially given my personal interest in, 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 uh, mm -hmm. in typography. Um, and then most recently, there's been a lot of next slide environmental concerns. I think there's, and, and, and generally I see that reflected more in French fiction than American fiction and, and, and earlier in French uh, comics than, than in American. Um, and, you know, to wrap that point up, you know, the late uh, translator, teacher and benefactor, Michael Henry Heim, you know, has a quote that I, I always loved. He said that you're ready to start translating when you can tell what the language is doing from what the author is doing with it. In other words, when you can tell convention from, from idiolect. But to this, I would add that, you know, what the genre is doing with the language is yet another category or a refinement of that, right? Genre has been defined usually on a more narrative level as a set of expectations and rules that govern both author and audience. And I would argue that these expectations extend to language, um, to register, to, to vocabulary, to lexicon, and um, more market categories than those that we regularly recognize as genres have such expectations. Arguably, even, you know, contemporary literature, if you analyze it in a Franco Moretti kind of, you know, num uh, uh, word crunching way, you would get certain sort of uh, certain constructions rising, syntactical constructions, word choices, pacing, rising to the surface, uh, especially mm -hmm. when you contextualize it in a time period. So, Questions, I can go to questions now because I think, uh, yeah, yes. Fabulous, so a few questions came in. Let me just, uh, you guys, I'm so, I, I have so many, this is great, um, very exciting. As we move into the Q&A, we invite you to turn your camera on if you'd like. To repeat, if you're comfortable speaking on screen, raise your hand either by clicking at the bottom of the participants list or by using the reactions button, and you'll be invited to unmute your microphone and ask the question yourself. If you prefer I read your question for you, just send it privately to Sedilla Alta Price in the chat. We'll try to get to all of them, but we apologize in advance if we run out of time. Now, if I can jump in, we've I've already gotten a few excellent questions. Sandra asks, do you find that you are off? Oh, do you wanna ask Sandra? No, okay, I got you. Uh, do you find that you are often frustrated at being constrained by the illustrations that don't coincide with your interpretation of the words? Um, I don't know if that frustration is, is the, um, no, I guess, I guess relatively, uh, I hate, I hate giving a no answer because it seems like shutting down the conversation, but I, I cannot recall off the top of my head a instant, an instance where that, was, that, that came to the forefront a lot, though I'm sure if I had enough time to dig, I would you know, prove myself completely wrong. <laughs> I will come in here and say, I, yeah, yeah. Asked, I put that question in before the example of the regard, 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 regard. All right. You, you kind of answered that question. Mm. By changing the words to fit the illustration. Mm, okay, well, in that case, I guess I think of, I guess the reason then frustration doesn't come up with, uh, come up that often is because I feel like I have a fairly free hand with that. Um, and I don't know if that, I don't know how to, what the, I don't know exactly what makes up that feeling. It could be just personal style, it could be, um, the fact that I don't get edited a lot, <laughs> um, you know, and that's, I think, an industry thing rather than um, a, uh, uh, you know, like that, that may be specific. I mean, when I do get edited, actually, it's, it's really, it's often a very good experience. I sort of miss and crave it sometimes because it's, and then often my, my closer relationships are going to be with a copy editor rather than, you know, an editor editor, right? Um. Thank you, Sandra. Um, let's see, I've got a two part question. And Evan, I see your hand up. Excellent. So Janet asks, Edward, do you pitch most of the comics you translate? Yeah, absolutely not. Um, so that's something that actually probably one of the questions I get the most from random strangers is, um, besides how do I get in 
is uh, how do I pitch a comic? And um, uh, I would say out of, also like out of nine or 10 prose books I've done, I've pitched uh, even half of them. Um, and then out of 450 some comics I've done, I've pitched four. So um, the ratio is really off. And it, is, it really is because comics publishers buy on art on the basis of art. And you know there have been minor comical early on experiences where they, you know, people were surprised when they finally got my translated script because they didn't exactly know what the story was about. They had a rough idea. And, um, uh, and, and so it's very hard to, to, to pitch on story or, um, for a comic. Excellent, that's very helpful, thank you. The second part of that question from Janet was, she says, I found translating FX the hardest. Korean has an incredibly wide range of onomatopoeia that can describe not just sound, but movement, textures, etc. Often, I can't find an equivalent. Any tips or go-to resources you use in translating these sorts of effects? Yeah, so I think there are more online libraries now of sound effects because the internet isn't what it was 15 years ago when I started translating comics, but I don't really use them, so I can't vouch for their quality. Um, I, I, it is something, you know, I, I gave a, a lecture on, just on sound effects, um, I don't know, three or four years ago at, and it was um, like, I, I, I sort of distantly touched the, uh, the Asian comic scene with a 10 foot pole because it seemed so, so much more complex, complex in, in its deployment of, you know, um, uh, of sound effects. And also because I was unfamiliar with what the solutions in the published English language versions had been. So, I mean, I would just, I don't know, I maybe like high self-esteem because uh, like, I, I do think there is it just like sort of, you're in a sandbox where there are very, very, very few rules. And um, um, I don't, you know, it's funny, one of the sound effect stories that I tell the most off, most frequently, which I didn't tell in, in this thing, because I didn't think I would have time. Um, I actually, um, just did it and people seemed to like it and then afterwards I made up a backstory for it to make it to give it more legitimacy but it and it, it so happened to fit neatly into certain niches in comic history but comics history but that was completely accidental so um I, I guess it's just like like a you know I I feel like my my best advice is uh you know uh ask um forgiveness later <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much. I love the concept of being in a sand sandbox where there are very, very few rules. Also, no, well, actually one more thing, it's just that, is that like, so the thing is, and also is that, is that they're artificial. You're not trying to, you know, they're artificial and they're heightened, right? Like if you think about Foley artists in, in, in the movies, right? Like when you watch a nature documentary, you're almost virtually never hearing actual animal sounds. You're hearing some guy moving rocks in a, in a literal sandbox, right? So, and, and so like, so you, you, you have complete plastic and, uh, a sort of structural freedom to in, to invent, and 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 that that is something that that um, I I, I think it, you you shouldn't feel constrained. Great, and the chat is lighting up with other translators with uh, sound effects ideas. <laughs> uh, Evan, you're up. Would you like to unmute yourself? Sure. Hi, Edward. Uh, Hi. Quick question about like signs that you see. It might be the same, like signs in the actual pictures, mm. in the same way that you like would see sound effects. So is it kind of more of like the translate first, ask questions later kind of <laughs> approach? Yeah, yeah. Signs actually is 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 uh it, that's a, that's a really good that that's a, that is a major component. Signs, newspapers, anything where there's like you know letters where there's large amounts of uh, of text, and then you're just like okay. So but but I do think that maps partly onto um. Apart from the like matching the visuals, it, that maps partly onto the the more literary I, um, question of like, you know, do I change names? Do I relocalize? You know, and it's like I I will. It's far more likely that I'll feel free to localize anything that's not set in contemporary France. And if there's some reason to to um um uh, or or if it's or if it's something crucial to the plot, you know, um uh, it's it 
even comics do make use of the footnote. And I think the footnote is not quite as vilified, mainly because perhaps Stan Lee was just so into them. Um, but, but um, uh, uh, you know, it's, so, so the, uh, I, I do think, uh, I, I've seen both solutions. I've seen footnoted versions, uh, generally often in nonfiction comics um, uh, to sort of keep vers verisimilitude. And then fiction comics will probably feel free to, to, to alter the content of, of signs um, and, and, and you know, other textual, uh, large block textual elements. Any other questions out there? If not, that's okay, because Edward has a spacious vision of the future of literary translation. Yeah, 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 really, okay, are, are you ready? Okay, so are, you, we, are we ready for that? Are, are you, are, nobody are, else has a question? For it. All right, so this is it. a question that we pose uh, to everybody who, who um, comes on to co-host a clinic, and uh, that is, um, what would an ideal future of literary translation look like to you? Yeah, so uh, this is your fault, Alex, because you asked for this, but I already. In the year 2525, if translators are still alive, if translation can survive, they may find. Well, Oh, anyway, so <laughs> toward the general end of harmonizing the progressive attitudes toward translation currently and popularly preached to um, our choir among us, you know, with the unexamined prejudices so widely held elsewhere, like academia, the lay public, I have a couple, you know, I have, I have a des desiderata, right? So I'd like to see translators in public conversation with non-translators outside the literary sphere. Uh, I'd like to expand the repertoire of metaphors. I mean, it's not like we actually need that. You know, everyone has a metaphor, like everyone has certain body parts. But, you know, um, uh, for me, uh, it's about the instrumentality and the contemporary relevance of the metaphors. The metaphors that I'm pushing generally are based, uh, you know, off of, you know, like, uh, I, I see them as instrumental, as not, not just sort of explanatory, right? Um, um, so to, uh, I'd like to explore the world of sort of interfacing and percep perception shaping that I, I find that uh, you know, translation fills. Uh, translation touches on so many aspects of our lives. So to combat the public assumption that the translation is the equivalent of the original, but, but not, you know, Goodreads leads, lists translations as the same book as the original. Um, I'd like to see us in conversation with you know, practitioners of other formerly invisible professions that are now getting recognition, you know, industrial and graphic design, lettering and typography, um, you know, craftsmen. Um, I think we could you know, draw a lot of metaphors from art history, history of photography. Um, you know, like uh, one thing I find, you know, I have a personal sort of a ongoing thought experiment is just whenever I'm reading something I, uh, about another discipline, I sub in translation for that discipline. And, see how well it maps on right you know uh, and then what the, the surprising thing is there are a lot of disciplines in the visual field with uh, a rhetoric of invisibility uh invisibility as a virtue right you see that in beatrice ward's uh um still quoted 1924 essay on you know on on typography where she complain uh, compares it to you know a pane of glass and the pane of glass is everywhere right it's in it's in it's 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 in uh orwell it's in um uh, it, it, it's in the, the I'm, I'm going to blank on his name, but he translated Borges, Norman, someone. Um, so uh, I'd love, anyway, that's number one. Number one is formerly invisible professions. Number two is legal and copyright scholars, because I find it really slippery exactly. If we're not, if, you know, what exactly, where does the IP reside, right? You know, um, recently there is that whole um, uh, Bruhaha about the kidney donor lady. And one of the things that I liked about was when they're talking about the legal defense about plagiarism, they talked about transformative use. You know, and it's just something that these are these are areas where I'm out of my depth. But you know, um, I was told that it was really hard to option a translation because it's hard to prove in court the difference between two translations. You know, but this is something that I'd like to get someone to talk to me about so I could learn, right? Um, I'd like to um, see us in, uh, in conversation with adaptation writers or like people who adapt other properties because 
adaptation, I think, is something that's so common in our day and age that it's interesting to me to graph that the history of how it gained wider acceptance, how we went from the default, the movie is worse than the book to the movie is different from the book, let us appreciate the constraints of different media. And, and, and so like that, if, if, if any of those strategies and lessons from that journey could be pulled into our journey as translators, uh, 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 trying to make translation more uh, visible, then that would be you know neat. And to that end, you know, I read the Net Netflix is um, starting a book club. So essentially, they're demanding, oh, so they're encouraging people to read the original and then watch their adaptation and have and do interviews with the the adapter to see you know like why they made the choices they did. And I think this is this yeah that's right. Also, uh, I'd like to talk to subtitlers and other forms of, of translation. Um, I'd like to talk to dubbers and voice talent, because this is something that's is interesting. Like I, when I hear that, like some people listen to Audible and, and they follow the same narrator around regardless of the book. Like, can we, you know, does anyone in the reading public follow a translator around regardless of the book? I mean, no translators do, but, you know, do, um, oral interpreters and fully artists, as we mentioned, but I'm also on specific issues. Um, on the, and sometimes I'll come across the review of the comic. Most comics I do don't get reviewed, but like they'll have a review by some comics oriented academic. And they have a lot of sometimes very specific but erroneous guesses about process um, or whether it's my own process or the, the publishing process. You know, and that's something, and at the same time, I've also had academics ask me questions directly about, you know, so like that's just another place where I, I would, all these, I love talking to other translators, but I would love to invite more people from somehow um, other these other fields. And then I'd also like to see different kinds of publication opportunities. Um, I'd love to serialize a novel. Uh, I don't know, or even a graphic novel or a novel. I mean, I know there. I know I'm aware of some of the economic impediments <laughs> to that, but I, you know, I don't. It's something that I'd like to see again. I'd like to see more multi-translator single author story collections. You know, Archipelago did one on, uh, of Tabuki not so long ago. Um, uh, like I said before, nonfiction comics are, I think, where it's at. And um, so I'd like to see more venues for long form comics journalism. And, you know, I know in France, there are some, you know, quarterlies and other very, very deluxely produced periodicals that specialize in this. And I know they wouldn't exist without France's completely different model of cultural funding. Like in the U.S., the closest thing we have is the nib, and the nib is fine, but the nib does not, not the nib neither has the production values nor the sort of artistic smoothness that you're going to find in the French ones. And I haven't even ex examined the scenes of other countries. And then I guess I'd also like to have more opportunities for translators to write about their work, not necessarily as advocates or explainers, but in a mushier way about process, because um, I think. If translation is to be thought of as its own art form, then I'd be interested in sort of paratranslational accounts of material circumstances of creation. Um, and then lastly, for me personally, I'd like to see a shift away from self-evident quality as a standard for evaluating both literary works and translations. Um, and, and I think this would sort of bring us toward a, a, a broader recognition of the historical contingency of, of paradigms of quality, right? Because I think paradigms of quality have been used to exclude genres readerships, um, you know, um, uh, and, and I, I see that changing already. So I, um, you know, and, 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 and a sort of concomitant to, that, concomitant to that is like, fans really have embraced the death of the author. Uh, you see that in, you know, even in Warner Brothers not inviting JK Rowling to their documentary on Harry Potter, <laughs> you know, so like, Everyone gets to, it's been said before, but everyone gets to celebrate, to fet the author's death, but us so far. So that would be, it would be good to, you know, be invited to that party. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my, uh, my little list. That's wonderful. I wonder, um, I know, I know you have it written down somewhere. Um, maybe, maybe uh, you have a blog, right? Uh, has, has this ever been publicized before? Because if you if you were to write it up, um, I think it would be worth sharing in it with a wider audience. Okay. Um, yeah. No, I don't. Um, I, I do have a blog, but it's inconsistently kept up and has a lot of lorem ipsum on it. Uh, okay. Because I can't. I can't be. 
I don't have time to write the copy. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, like, uh, but yeah, no, that's a, the, I, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, you know, to, lot, to, get, to get the vision out there, right. we got to get the vision out there. Propagate the vision. Mm -hmm. We'll have a transcript of this video. So this video will go out into the world and then we'll, right. we'll all help spread the transcripts. Right. Um, thanks to our captioner, Bernice. So uh, last call for questions. We have a minute left. Now or never. All right. Um, thank you so much. That's all we have time for today. Thank you again to the Center for Fiction for hosting these clinics. And thank you again, Edward and Alex, for joining us tonight and blowing our minds. Mm -hmm. um, translation clinics take place on the third Thursday of every month. Please sign up to be notified of upcoming events. Join us next month to hear me and Kareem James Abu Zaid talk about how to prioritize what is most important when honing the vision for your translation. The registration link is in the chat and on the Center for Fiction's website. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Please stay safe. Thanks everyone for coming. And here's the link for next month. I was just going to ask, you put the link in the chat. I can't read and drop the links at the same. I mean, there are multitaskers out there. I'm not one of them. <laughs> thank Edward. you so much for coming, everybody. Uh, thank no, you so thank much. you. Thank you for, for having, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks to the audience for some fabulous questions. Yay.